Hello, I'm Dr. Larry Carnes, and welcome to Books of the Month. We are so excited to have our very special guest with us today, Kay Thompson. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. We're excited. Why don't you introduce yourself to our viewing audience and tell them a little bit about who you are? Okay. Uh, I'm Kay Thompson, and uh, when my mother wanted my attention, she would call me Catherine. So um, uh, I grew up in New Jersey. And when I graduated high school, I worked for a year or so and I met an airman uh, that was just um, going overseas. And he spent 18 months in Turkey. And when he came back, we got married and I moved to California. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> a big change. I was the first one in my family to move that far away. And, uh, and I've been out here ever since. And I live in Roseville at the moment, lived in the Bay Area for about mm, 45 years. And uh, when my husband passed away, I decided that I couldn't afford to stay there. So I have moved up here um, and God has been really good and brought another man into my life. And I've been married almost four years to him. Well, that's a blessing, that's a blessing. You have this powerful, exciting book that you've written finding joy in the midst of grief. And then I like this continuing in God's love. That's powerful, continuing in God's love. Tell our audience about this powerful book that you've written. And I noticed how you navigate your journey. I looked here, it said, journey to joy takes its readers along twists and turns as the author walks through the tunnel of grief while dealing with the loss of her husband of 44 years. So powerful. Talk to us about that. Well, when, uh, when I first got married, moved to California, um, and I should say we have, uh, my husband and I had two girls and six grandchildren, and there was a seventh, but he only lived a couple hours. So that was kind of like the first death in our immediate family. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to watch your child bury their child, even though it's a newborn, it's still a dramatic loss. Yes. So, um, and then we ended up um, doing a lot of ministry at church. My husband and I were both involved in the music ministry and we traveled with the team. I worked for the music pastor and we traveled all over the country, took a tour over to Europe. Um, with the singers and the instruments and he played trumpet. So uh, he always kind of went along, okay. but um, eventually, you know, age comes and time comes and you change, um, everything kind of changes for you. And so I accepted Christ when I was 13 at a camp, the only summer camp I was ever allowed to go to because we couldn't afford them. And, um, but then I didn't realize there's a difference between accepting Christ as your savior and being committed to him. Ah. There, for me, at least there was a difference, you know, okay, I accepted Christ, I'm saved and I'm done. And that wasn't the case. And so uh, when I was 21 uh, and a brand new mom, um, and I realized that there was something still missing and it was my own personal commitment to the Lord to serve him. So yes. I put 17 years in the music ministry at church and, and so did my husband. And then um, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's and he had been a printer, a lithographer in the days of when you hand developed all your film. Yes. And, a long time ago. In the and, dark room. Yes, yes, <laughs> with no circulation. And he would come home just smelling so bad of chemistry. And actually the Parkinson's seminar taught us that the hand developing chemicals are the worst chemicals. They're worse than the, the sprays and stuff outside. And they just eat away at the cells of your brain. So ah. 30 some years in a dark room, you know, he, he was lucky that he didn't have it worse than he did. He was able to um, still do some landscaping work because he went from lithography to landscaping. And he was able to do some of it, but the Parkinson's really kind of made it very difficult. So he ended up with um, 
medication that helped to stop the tremors and stuff. But then different things began to show up. And mm -hmm. um, he lost 25 pounds in two weeks time. And we thought maybe it was the medication, but it wasn't. It was stage four colon cancer. And they had bypassed that whole thing in a colonoscopy. And so, you know, he was fighting two giants, Parkinson's and colon cancer. Stage yes. four. And so um, it, it became a very complicated way of trying to live for both of us. And okay. so um, he ended up passing away in 2008, August 10th, 2008. And um, he said to me a couple of days before he died, he said, I know that I'm not going to be here long, but I don't know which one is going to take me first. And so hard as it was, God was gracious, didn't let him suffer like so many people do. Yes. And, but that whole walk taught me that I needed to hang on to God in a whole different way than I had ever done. And, um, you know, hanging on to his hand and walking with him and actually living what I say I believe. And so um, the book kind of came out of all our nightly blogs that I would yes, write. And yes. we had a lot of friends that wanted to know how he was and what could they do and what could they pray for. And so I began to put it in an email every couple nights. And um, that's where the book came from. Okay. So you were navigating your journey, mm -hmm. uh, journaling and, and blogging as you and your husband went through this process right now right. that's so very powerful you say something here you said it's not easy to accept life when god takes something cherished from your grasp as you read through the pages and the pathway traveled you will find that god does not punish us rather he opens our hands and hearts to receive what he has for those of us who remain until our own journey comes to an end. You said something that was so powerful. You spoke, you said now, there's a difference between accepting him and being committed to him. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful statement. Unpack that for us, if you will. Well, when my dad was a pastor in a Methodist church in Barrington, New Jersey, and so, um, I would listen to him preach and I was always so afraid that I would lose my salvation. And uh, I had accepted Christ at, you know, like I said, at my summer camp, one of those campfire um, come to Jesus meetings. And, um, and I thought that was good. But then listening to dad and knowing where my head was during the week and things that I wasn't proud of, I would say, okay, something is missing. But um, there's a difference between saying yes to Jesus and then saying, yes, I will follow you. Wow. Um, I found that to be different for me. Maybe others don't find that to be so true, but uh, I think we need to make the commitment to follow him. And he brought me to California. He brought me to, um, to work in the church here for so many years. And it was a blessing to be able to do what I did. Um, my, my worship pastor would say to me, Katie, I want you to go learn how to do whatever it was. And I'd say, I don't know how to do that. And he would say, yes, you do. You can go figure it out. And I found that he was probably, Pastor Deal was probably the most powerful um, Christian that I knew. He mm -hmm. walked the talk. We hear people say, walk the talk. And he was one that did it. And by example, I realized that I wasn't always walking the talk and I needed to make some changes. Interesting. So you had a contemporary who could demonstrate to you what it meant to actually walk mm -hmm. what you were saying. Right. Walk the talk. I say many times our words say, but our actions show. Yes. And so yes. you were connected to someone whose actions demonstrated what his yes. words were saying. Yes. You yes. talk about that commitment earlier. Mm -hmm. from a, from the perspective of commitment to you what does that mean to you unpack that for us commitment well um my first husband and i taught sunday school for 21 years we taught i think it was 13 years of middle school students okay. 
and eight years of high school students. And then after that, and a couple years break, we taught four year olds. That's where we were when he passed away. Um, but I realized that you couldn't, in my case, I could not teach these students, whatever age bracket we were in, mm -hmm. I couldn't teach them what I thought the Bible said and do something different myself. Oh my. So you could not stand there and teach one thing, mm -hmm. what the Bible was saying, mm -hmm. and your actions be doing something else. Right, right. That's a powerful, powerful testimony. Thank you. Thank you. God has done wonders in my life. And just, um, you know, I never did drugs. I didn't do that whole scene. But it was just my attitude and the company that you kept sometimes was not really what it should have been. And I thought, you know, I can't tell these kids that this is a good idea. And you need to follow Christ doing this, mm -hmm. of, and then I'm doing this over here. And it just didn't quite meet in the middle. So I knew I needed to make some changes, and I recommitted my life to Christ. And um, he's just taken me leaps and bounds since then. That is so powerful. Now, you just touched something that's, that speaks volumes. You said, my attitude. Yeah. Many believers don't think about that attitude when it comes to their walk with Christ. Right. That attitude, that mindset, that those traits that really speak to who we are. Right. Once you had the transformation in attitude, mm -hmm. what did that do for you internally? And then how did it impact those who you knew? Um, well, I think that, you know, for me, it just made me aware all the time, made me have a better prayer life with Christ. Um, and it's, you know, I still have a prayer time in the evening with God and just being thankful for what he's done for me, thankful that I can see today, thankful I can get out of bed today. Um, and because of the grief that I went through when my husband passed away, yes. I've been able to facilitate 23 sessions of grief support and uh, over these past years. So I hope and pray, and I've been mm. told that I have helped some of uh, those that walk through grief with being able to face their their sorrow and, and learn to focus on God because he's the only way you can really get through it. And so one time we were living in Sunnyvale and before my husband died in one of the we were in an apartment at the time and one of the neighbors met me in the balcony to our office our rooms and he said what is it that's so different about you oh, said, oh i don't know and i thought oh somebody's watching so then i had a chance to explain who christ was in my life and what a difference that it made where it that went is him, so I don't know but people are watching and so i'm pretty conscious of it all the time that people are watching and I'm not perfect by any, any, you know, things will annoy me and I might grumble a bit. And then I say, oh, I shouldn't do that. So then you got to ask for forgiveness and start <laughs> over. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're all striving for perfection. So that's, yes. you yeah. know, we're striving to mature. Right. And we're striving for perfection. But yeah. you said something that's so very important here. You said that the person asked, what is it that's different about you? And that's because your conversation, your actions, your behaviors, your mannerisms spoke volumes. We're going to stay right there and we're going to take a break and be right back. And we're okay. going to pick up on that. Your conversation, your actions spoke volumes. We'll be right back. Don't go anyplace. Thank you. Welcome back. That was so powerful. Now, give us a bit about that last statement that you made. Um. Being able to, to um, show by your attitude and your uh, response to people, standing in a grocery line, now being at a gas station, being in traffic, you know, how do you respond to these people that are around you? Because it's not just the person you bump up against in the hallway. Yeah. Uh, everybody that you, you uh, pass and, and meet, you never know who's watching and um, you need to be consistent in what you believe. That is so powerful. Be consistent. Okay. I repent for the traffic because sometimes I, I have <laughs> to lose too. it right there. That's yeah, powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. Now yeah. let's, let's, let's do this. Oh no. Where did he go? Speak to us about this powerful book. Oh no. I like that. 
Where <laughs> did he go? Talk to us about that. Okay. Um, so this book came out of actually my husband's funeral. Um, we had, like I said, six grandchildren. We had four boys, two girls. And um, actually my youngest granddaughter, who is now t almost 20 years old, did all the illustrations in the book. Oh. And uh, she's a wonderful illustrator. But um, they were young, you know, 14 years ago, they were young. And so grandpa, where was he? Um, and mm. they knew he, had, three of them had been at the house uh, the night that he died. He had, they'd been at the dinner table with us and he went to lay down and he started gasping for air. And that was kind of the end. The kids stayed with their dad out in the family room, but they watched grandpa go out in the gurney to the ambulance and it never came back. And so when we did the funeral um, at the graveside, my nephew, who is a pastor, lives in Canada at the moment, um, he came and he did the service at the graveside. Okay. And the kids had hermit crabs in there. They had a tank of fish and a tank of hermit crabs. And so Craig took, that my nephew took the whole story of a hermit crab because there was a hermit crab in one shell. He got too big and he moved to a different shell. And Jensen, who is my grandson, um, he was trying to find where this hermit crab went. And so Craig was telling him and showing him, you know, live in the, in the uh, aquarium that um, are in the tank for the crabs, you know, what, how they did. And they told him the story of it and how the hermit crab took his, himself, sorry, and uh, put him, found a bigger shell, a better shell. Yeah. And so grandpa took this sick body and this sick shell and moved it to a better shell. Because oh, yes. Jesus. Jesus. And so that's how this whole book came about. JT in the book is my grandson. He's now, in fact, he was here this morning. He's on his way to uh, Washington State to the Navy base. So um, life has changed for all of us. And, um, but it just helped the kids understand what their emotions are because the kids have, all children have different kinds of emotions. At yes. the time, time my grand, at the time my husband passed away, um, we were teaching four-year-olds Sunday school and four of the four-year-olds came to the viewing. We had a, I, we don't do viewings very much anymore, um, but my family, that's their tradition back East. And um, my oldest daughter and her children lived in Illinois. And I wanted them to be able to say, this is where I saw my grandpa. This is, you know, I know where he is. He just didn't okay. disappear. And so we did a short um, viewing and two of the parents from the Sunday school kids brought their children to the viewing because the kids wanted to know where Mr. Thompson was and okay. where he went. And so it gave us an opportunity, even in death, to be able to share the love that Jesus has for us, that he was taking care of grandpa and he put him in a better place. So, oh no, where did he go? Sort of takes the journey, navigates that journey and explains... Okay. Right. On, a, on a younger basis where the children yeah. can understand. Right. What right. are some key things in there? Oh, no, where did he go? What are some key things that you point out in this powerful book? Can I show you a page? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, we talk about the emotions, the mixed emotions that kids have. Okay, mixed emotions. They have all these different emotions and they don't know what to do with them. Yes. And so we walk through these different emotions, fear and sadness. And can you be happy? In fact, one of the pages talks about Jensen thinking, how does grandpa get out of that hole in the ground where we put the box? Oh. And so we, Jensen and I went back to the cemetery. I picked him up at school in grandpa's truck. I'd never driven the truck. And I thought, okay, we're going to do this. So I went and picked him up at grade school. We went to the cemetery, stopped and bought flowers. And we sat and talked about why grandpa does not need to get out of the hole in the ground and that he just is already gone, that God came for him and took him to heaven to be with him. And yes. um, Jensen in the book uh, comes to an understanding that because he has accepted Christ in his life, yes. that he has the opportunity to see his grandpa in heaven someday. My, my, my. So you, you take it 
and you make it palatable for a kid mm -hmm. to where they can understand and navigate the journey and make sense of it. Yes. That yes. is such a gift. That is so powerful. And the illustrations in there speaks volumes because children think in pictures. Yes, they do. And, and yes, that's I powerful. Had a chap I'm sorry. I had a chaplain uh, buy one of my books and she said she wanted to use it for some of the um, people that she was doing services for. Yes. And one of them was a woman and she said, do I have your permission to change it from grandpa to grandma? And I said, certainly. Uh, because um, God does not differentiate between gender and race. Absolutely. We're all the same in God's eyes. Yes, we yeah. are. Yes, we are. I, that, that's, that's a powerful statement. And I believe that what you just said, when we come to the realization of that and begin to practice that, that we are all co-equals in the eyes of God. Oh, absolutely. God doesn't deal with gender, but we're all one and he sees us all as the same. Right. That is so powerful. And what a testimony that God would grace you to be able to author this book. And now it's such an asset that a chaplain would say, you know what? I need to take this and use this because it's going to bring comfort and healing to others. That right. is so powerful. How did it make you feel when that happened? Somebody asked me once, did I think I would make millions with either of the books? I said, no, that's not the purpose. Um, royalties would be nice, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to be able to share what God has done for our family and for me through the death and the sadness of losing the man that I had loved for so long. Mm. And, um, you know, there's, we all have um, different opportunities to share Christ. And this just happens to be where God has put me to share the love of Christ in my life with other people who are suffering. So it's amazing how out of our pain comes passion and out of our passion, you know, we discover our purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a passion for that thing. We discover our purpose for that. And God is, is, is just using you to do some amazing things in the kingdom and in the world. I believe it, that it, it goes into the marketplace also. I'm, I'm hoping that that's the case because there's hurting people everywhere. I've had a number of different uh, kind of losses in the grief classes that I've facilitated. One had, uh, her son was a police officer that was shot in the line of duty, killed instantly. And, um, and she just last year invited my new husband and I to go to his 30th birthday party. Yes. Dead for three years. And she said, I finally could say goodbye to my son today. Oh, my. So, um, it, it takes people a long time. It doesn't happen overnight and some longer than others. Yes. But, um, and I had one woman whose grandson um, had um, an epileptic spasm in the bathtub and drowned. And so it's just, you know, everybody is different. It's not all spouses. It's not all parents or grandparents. It's a lot of different cases, yes. but God loves, God loves us all. And we want to make sure that we uh, share the gospel with everyone that we touch. That's amazing. You know, I, I like to say it this way, when I'm doing things, speaking to people, when they have the loss of a loved one, you know, <laughs> I like to share with God doesn't take our loved ones from us, but he will receive our loved ones mm -hmm. because yeah. he loves us so much that he wouldn't take something that he, from us, someone yeah. from us, when he yes. knows it's going to bring pain, but he will receive them into himself. Yes. Yeah, and and I, I find that that gives them a sense of comfort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I find you doing with these amazing books is that you're, you're being an instrument where God's using you to be a sense of comfort, an extension of his comfort and his Thank peace you. when Thank people you. are navigating these very difficult journeys. And, and it is just so, 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 so powerful, so powerful amazing you know, some of my uh, classes well almost in every one there's somebody that will say but why i don't understand why this and why that and we don't have the answers to that and i have yes. been able to say that we don't need to have the answers because we wouldn't understand god's thinking anyway and our job of a, as a believer is to trust that the man who never makes a mistake has taken care of our loved one you know god mm -hmm. never makes a mistake he's always on time he's never late um and he just doesn't make mistakes so when we can't understand our job is to trust 
Mm, you know, I, I, I was looking at, at some of the scriptures that you have uh, that, do, that, that you were put there when you talk about finding joy in the midst of the grief. And I just looked, you, you looked at the scripture there in Psalm 62, it talked about God being our, our rock and our salvation, mm -hmm. you know, and so that speaks volumes to that. And you went on to talk about some things. Uh, you had some, 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 some words on there, joy, opportunity, bless, praise. So it speaks from your heart exactly what the intimacy of your relationship is. We have two minutes left. Take the time now to tell our audience how they can get in touch with you. If there's a website, if there's an email and information that they need, how they can get in touch with you and how they can get these powerful books. So um, either way will find me. Uh, you'll, the first one, the website will take you to uh, interesting facts about the different books. And uh, there's some uh, uploads that have just been done. There's a tab for devotions and a tab for blogs and uh, just check it out. And the one thing that is most important to me is what I learned from our pastor in Los Altos years ago, the word joy, if you'd use it as an acronym, J for Jesus first. O for others second, Y for yourself last. Wow, that's powerful. J for Jesus order. first, mm -hmm. O for others second, mm -hmm. Y for yourself last. Right. That that reminds me of something I say always remember to out love, out serve, and out forgive. It's been mm -hmm. a pleasure to have you as our guest. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being a part of Books of the Month. For those of you who are viewing, make sure you take that information, go and get these powerful books. Kay, thank you so much for being right. our guest. Thank you. I appreciate the time.